the stage was set. On September 9th, the world's two great sporting powers would meet in the Olympic basketball final. To accommodate American television, the game would begin at 30 minutes before midnight. As the game evolved, it became apparent that the deliberate pace of play was better suited to the Soviet style of basketball. Brewer from the outside, misses. We were kind of at a disadvantage because we couldn't get control of the tempo and we couldn't get out and run. So we were playing their kind of game. They controlled the pace of the game. It was a very slow-paced game, which played right into their hands. When you play a team that's big and strong like they were and you slow it down, you miss a shot, you only get one attempt. Right, Jones misses. Before you know it, you're down. This guy, Sergei, is better than I thought because I hadn't seen a guard yet that our guards couldn't upset. Isolations, pick and rolls, and things where he controlled the ball and shot and scored at will. Led by 10 straight Sergei Belov points, the Soviets took a 10-point lead and then stayed comfortably ahead of the Americans in a physical game that would get even rougher in the second half. They had somebody come off their bench, start an altercation with our starting center, Dwight Jones. Gorkia was told to cover the U.S. player tight, to play on the edge of a foul. But his hot Asian character and hard play by the American led to a fight. If we see both players to do something incorrect together in the same time, it's not possible to start to see who is the first, who is the second. This is the moment where the referees do something to don't have more problems. I believe they are both out. They lost their 12th guy, we lost our top center. I think we lost an exchange. I believe so. So I think it was orchestrated and it worked. The dismissal of the American player was beneficial to us, but there were absolutely no special requests to get the best U.S. players out of the game. Kondrashin, our coach, would never let that happen. He was a sportsman to the marrow of his bones. The second thing they did was they took one of our players out. And if Sage goes up and Brewer has been shaken up and he is really our other big man or other big rebounder, Bill. I wasn't sure at the time whether it was dirty play, but it looked dirty to me. Head snapped back, that jump with Alexander Belov. But after going to Europe and seeing the European mentality, how things happen over there, it was all orchestrated. There's no doubt in my mind. I've seen it happen over and over over there, where they have a plan of what they're going to do, and they do it. We couldn't ever think it was possible to play this honestly. It was by no means planned. Both incidents happened completely unexpectedly. The streak on the line, 63 straight, seven gold medals. Many of this jam-packed basketball hall sitting in almost stunned silence. It's time to go. We, we can't wait no longer. We've got to pick it up. We've got to get possession and go with it. We've got to press or this game's going to be over. And Coach Ivers said, do what you have to do. The full press. Let's go down and pick them up. Let's start pressuring them. Let's let it all hang out here. We're jumping. We're scrambling. We're hustling. The U.S. down, down by six. And we're forcing them to play up tempo. Tommy Henderson going back out to Kevin Joyce. Kevin Joyce. We started pressing. We started running. We're moving it back in the game. Joyce hits. Kevin Joyce brings it up. And he hits. You see the look in the other team's eye when they don't know how to handle the press. And we could see that they were in trouble, and they didn't have a clue. They were throwing the ball all over the place. The tension of the game and the nearness of the victory began to toll on us in the closing minutes. Even Sergei Belov, our most dependable player, would lose the ball in a fit of uncertainty. The frantic American rally would eventually bring them to within a single point. With time running out, the U.S. team and Doug Collins unexpectedly found themselves in position to take their first lead of the night. We were just six seconds from victory. Alexander Pelov had the ball, and if he passed it to me, I would have held the ball under my t-shirt, and no one could have taken it from me. I remember feeling that the guy was sort of trapped down there, so I slid in before I could sort of hide a little bit. Alexander looked me right in the eyes, ready to pass me the ball, but threw it diagonally instead. 
Suddenly, Doug Collins cuts into the center of the court and peeks of the past. Lots of years have passed, but I still have that picture in my mind. But the Russians recover now intercepted. Five seconds. Four seconds. The Russian player, seeing he couldn't defend it, had one thought in mind. He was going to cut my legs out from underneath me. Doug Collins goes into the basket support. It was catastrophic, like a nuclear bomb explosion. I hated Alexander at that moment. I was ready to kill him then. He had ruined the victory by his own hands. All the training, the dreams we had, the victory we had achieved, all of a sudden it falls to the ground. The coaches came out to see if everything was okay. They were talking, maybe they should get somebody in to shoot the free throws for me. And I'll never forget Coach Ivan, sort of that gravelly voice of his saying, if Doug can walk, he's going to shoot him. And what pressure you put on a young man. He's got to walk to the line, down one, to shoot what I believe then and now, and perhaps forever, were the two most pressure-filled free throws any American has ever shot at any level of competition in the history of basketball. The free throws insane. Doug Collins has tied it up. I just sort of went back to all the free throws I've shot in my backyard as a little kid, no time on the clock, all the times I practiced. He hit nothing but the bottom of the net. You know, with three more seconds left in the game, and finally we realized that the gold medal was going to be ours. The United States was three seconds from gold, but as it happened, it was three seconds that would last a lifetime. Somebody has gone down on the floor, and Bedlam has taken over here at the basketball hall. They're changing the clock is what they're doing. They're going back to three seconds is what the PA announcer said. Everybody trying to calm everybody else down, and it would appear it's all over. Wow, what a finish the United States. Winning their eighth and second in gold medal. This place has gone crazy. Now we're being told the scoreboard is not correct. Well, confusion reigns, but the United States still, they have that one-point lead, 50-49. Now the clock shows three seconds. There is time for the Russians to go to their big man, Alexander Belov. They're going to try. Alexander Belov. And the Russian team has robbed Alexander Belov. And this time it is over. The game was stolen from the Americans. The shamelessness of it all is laughable, naturally, because it was such an obvious and pathetic miscarriage of justice, an unimaginable travesty and joke and a farce. I yelled, victory, nothing but victory, and I was jumping and dancing with complete joy. These three seconds in Munich were wonderful and will be in my heart until the day I die. It was a robbery. It was a total robbery. There's a saying, the rifle on the wall shoots a man, and we took what we deserved. For us, it was most pleasant and made us popular victors. My name sometimes appears in crossword puzzles. This is the first and last time I've ever wanted to kick the television set in at the end of the game. The United States got screwed. The game was pure glory. We were paid 3,000 rubles and it helped me become fit financially. <laughs> it also brought much happiness to my family. It was hocus pocus, absolutely, blatantly cheating and stealing. Until my dying day, I will never change my mind. It was a legal game completely, and we are very proud of the victory. Astonishing, uh, beyond astonishing, outrageous. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and I couldn't understand it. It was an injustice. It was a terrible injustice. We were put up high in the clouds in Moscow after the victory. They recognized us in the streets. The fifth 
secretary of the Young Communist Party Committee made a speech saying, not a year, not a month, not a week, not an hour, but a second is to be valued. Look at our basketball players. They gave us a priceless lesson. They taught us to care about seconds. In my book, they didn't win, pure and simple. We beat them, fair and square. If those three seconds hadn't existed, they should have been invented. This game changed our lives. Something big was happening before a 13-year-old boy's eyes. Something he couldn't believe. A miracle. A miracle that overturned the whole world. The Americans lost for the first time at our hands. What could be more miraculous? The final moments that night were chaotic. But a closer look at the game's ending might be less confusing than it is enlightening. I was one of the committee of three who were in charge of the whole Olympic tournament called the Technical Committee. Dr. Jones? Secretary General William Jones, Al Ramsey of Australia, and myself presided over the game. And the three of us sat directly behind the bench of the Soviet Union. When Doug Collins was given his two foul shots, Kondrashin, our coach, told me to signal for a timeout after Collins' first shot. In 1972, by international rule, only a coach on the bench could call a timeout. He would press a handheld buzzer to alert the official scorer of his request to stop play. Timeouts could only be granted during periods when the clock was stopped. In this case, either before or after Collins' first free throw. When Collins hit the first shot, I stamped my fist on the table. Where is the timeout? Give us the timeout. And the FIBA representative saw it all, sitting three meters from our bench and the scorer's table. My position allowed me to observe the Soviet coach trying to call a timeout by using the electrical signal. But for whatever reason, the scorer's table made a mistake. They failed to respond to the request when they should have. When the referee hands the ball to Doug Collins, the ball is in play and it distinctly states that you cannot call a timeout when the ball is in play. If you listen real closely, as I'm getting ready to shoot the second free throw, the horn blows. Disregarding the horn, the referee who was at the baseline handed the ball to the Soviets for their inbound pass. I make the gesticulation to continue the game, and they put the ball in play. And for some ungodly reason, Brigetto, the official, put his hand in the air. And the whistle blew. And I'm thinking, there's no foul. You know, why did the whistle blow? Well, it was the Russian coach and the players who was right in front of their bench. I call for a timeout. I call for a timeout. Where's my timeout? It was at this point that William Jones came down on the court towards the table and said, I saw the Soviets asking for the timeout, which was refused. Why didn't you give it to them? This is a mistake. According to the official clock, there was now one second left to play. But the American players and television viewers were puzzled by the presence on the court of William Jones, the Secretary General of the International Basketball Federation. Jones not only wanted to give the Soviets their missed timeout, but something even more precious. Dr. Jones, Dr. Jones held up his three fingers. He showed the teams that there's three seconds to play. Putting three seconds back on the clock. The Russians should be awarded three more seconds. He said that we still have three seconds left. I want three seconds and nothing else. I kept saying to Dr. Jones, you can't put time back on the clock. Only God can do that. It was lunacy. He had no business being there, and the referee had no business listening to him. Until the game is over and the referee signed the score sheet, they are totally in charge of the game. But Mr. Jones was a dictator. But the German scorekeeper and timer just felt that this was a travesty. I can understand uh, people in the United States who have the feelings that they were robbed. No one of us for table officials understands this. The only person who indicated three seconds 
boss, Mr. Jones. Why? I think he wanted to show he was the kingpin. Even though he was the one who writes all the rules. And he was the one that is responsible for the rule on how to call timeouts. And yet he went against his own rule. This much is certain. The rules for calling a timeout were clear. The Soviets should not have been granted one as long as the ball was in play. As soon as it was given to Doug Collins, the timeout should not have been recognized. No amount of uncertainty at the scorer's table or the intent of the Soviet coach should have influenced any decision. At that point, play should have continued from the time it was halted, with one second remaining. The judgment and subsequent ruling of Mr. Jones to demand that the clock be reset to three seconds and that the Soviets be given another opportunity to inbound the ball were based solely on his own interpretation of what was fair, not the written rule. The official announcement was that the Russians were trying to get a timeout, so therefore they felt that they should have received it. Well, I was trying to score 30 points too, but they didn't continue the game long enough for me to do that. Despite their bewilderment, the Americans had no choice but to return to the court as the Soviets prepared to inbound the ball for the second time. They take the ball out, they throw it in. Game's over. We're celebrating, we're jumping around. The United States wins it 50-49. People on the floor are waving flags and kissing you and hugging you. Everybody's celebrating a victory. We were absolutely ecstatic. We were on top of the world. They were jumping for joy and I was jumping for joy. And then suddenly, confusion. There are another three seconds less. What the heck just happened here? Just as the ball is put into play, you can hear the siren go off. It was obvious that this was not the siren to end the game, but the signal from the timer's bench that there was still a problem with the clock. It had not been properly reset. The three seconds had not been played, and everyone knew this. It was obvious. This time, in a hasty effort to continue the game, the referee handed the ball to the Soviets before checking with the timekeeper. The game clock was still in the process of being manually reset and mistakenly read 50 seconds. After the Soviets inbounded the ball, the official timekeeper sounded the horn to alert the referees of the error. It was not to signal the end of the game. Understandably puzzled, the Americans searched in vain for answers amid the swarming mass of confusion. Nothing was being said to us as players except play. And the referees, by virtue of their nationalities and inability to communicate, weren't saying very much to each other. We had a Brazilian who spoke Portuguese and a Hungarian who spoke French and Hungarian. It was the Tower of Babel. Who do I talk to? Who understands what I'm saying? Iba, in the midst of all of that craziness, had been jostled around and manhandled. Mr. Iba, he had been pickpocketed. He lifted his wallet with all his money. I thought Hank Iba was going to have a heart attack. He went red in the face. He just didn't know what to do. We should have let off the floor and let them do whatever they wanted to do. We should have gone straight to the dressing room and never come back out. Don Haskins was the other assistant coach, and he said, Coach, let's walk. Let's walk to the locker room. We'll win if it's appealed. Dr. Jones said to me, put the United States team on the floor or forfeit the gold medal. Coach Iber debated it. He said, Johnny, we're not going to lose the gold medal sitting on our ass. Put the United States team on the floor. After the clock was properly reset to three seconds, the United States team reluctantly took the floor again and waited for the Soviets to inbound the ball for the third time. While the Soviets regrouped, the Americans were caught unprepared as Ivan Ideshko's court-long pass and Alexander Belov's unlikely basket gave the Soviet Union the win. The Americans' frustration was understandable, but while they had good reason to complain about the first two incidents, a closer look at the final play shows a hazy American point of view with a clear lack of accountability. As they're lining up for the third attempt, the referee instructs the man guarding the inbounds to step back, giving the opportunity for the Russian to throw the full length of the court. 
I remember I make a sign. This is a line with that sign. I like to remind that Macmillan, it's not possible he transpass with the hands that line. I think he knows that, but it's necessary I remind him in that moment special. I can remember Tom's expression. He sort of turned around with his hands like this, going like, what's happening? I was trying to get up to the line to stop the pass, and he was telling me to get off the line. He said, get back. He was telling me to get off the line. It, it was ridiculous. No, <laughs> in that time, I don't speak at all in English. I speak French. I remember very well. Uh, I don't talk with nobody. Also, if you watch his feet, he steps over the line throwing the ball in. As the ball's in the air, I see Bailoff with both hands shove our guy in the back and just push him out of the way. He just turned, grabbed Jimmy by the jersey and just pushed him back in toward the support. Those wicked tongues. We've watched the game many times. These things are just not true. The American made the mistake himself and gave me the rule. I needed to make the long pass. His foot was behind the line and only crossed it after he threw the ball, which is legal. The two American defenders are to blame for not covering Belov. They let him catch this long pass. Belov didn't foul. He simply positioned himself between them and made the basket. It was not a big deal to defend this pass. They are to blame once the game got to this point. The Americans simply thought that they became champions too early. They were celebrating, fell into a trance, and took the last three seconds for granted. It is their fault for not taking us seriously enough. One should fight to the end. It simply has to be said, and I'm 100% convinced, that it all happened according to the rules, after the original errors at the scorer's table. And taking the entire game into account, it's justified to say that the Soviets fairly won the gold medal. You have to say that the victory was fair, but maybe not particularly square. If you are an athlete and you train your life to get to a particular moment, which is a pinnacle of a certain kind of competition, whether you're Doug Collins or Alexander Bilov, you have the right to have a competently run game. One can fully understand why the Americans felt betrayed. They were betrayed by something they had a perfect right to ask for, and that is competence on the part of the people who were running their competition. Remember the movie 12 Angry Men? That's basically what it comes down to. 12 guys who were really, really ticked off. We felt we got jobbed and we weren't going to take it. They wanted us as Americans to accept the silver. And that was when we then got together and said, look, we're not going to accept the medals. They're trying to give us the wrong medal. We ain't taking no silver medal. We're not going out there for the ceremony. If we go out there and accept the silver medal, what we're doing is we're saying, you know what, it's okay what you did to us. We don't want that silver medal, and we're going to tell the world that we don't want it. We won the game, and if we don't get the actual symbol, which is the gold medal, then we want nothing else. The Americans' refusal to accept the silver medal left the stand empty for the first time in Olympic history. The Soviets willingly took the gold, basking in their victory, but never forgetting or forgiving the conduct of the bitter Americans. I must admit, I didn't like the way the Americans behaved. It marred my attitude toward them. If you are a true athlete and a man, you must be strong enough to lose. They've always been terribly insulted that the Americans never accepted our victory. They lacked courage and simply couldn't admit that they were silver medalists. I guess basketball in America only means gold. They didn't just lose, they felt insulted in losing the game to the Russians. And they were sore losers. They were entirely too self-presumptuous and were too busy looking down their noses. How about giving respect to their rival? Where is it? To this day, 
the silver medals that the United States refused to accept remain locked in a vault at the Olympic Museum in Luzerne, Switzerland. They sit there untarnished, waiting to be claimed. Every year they still call my mother's house and ask me to go, I want a silver medal, and I just tell them, thanks, but no thanks. There's no way. We didn't win that. We won the gold. Personally, wish they wouldn't try and give us the medals because they know what the answer is going to be, so I think that's an exercise in futility. Somebody wanted to go back and correct the wrong that was done. They can give us our gold medal. It's been more than a decade since the Soviet Union was broken apart. The intense nationalistic sporting rivalry between the United States and the Soviets is now a distant memory. But for the players, the battle endures. It is a Cold War court controversy that will live forever, crystallized, three seconds from gold. There is a good Russian saying, time cures. It's part of history now, but maybe time has come for the Americans to accept defeat and forget it. Perhaps we should get the two teams together and organize a meeting. We could discuss the game, who was right and who was wrong. And then we would award the silver medals to the Americans during a ceremonial reception. And after that, we would have a big party and everything will be fine. Screw you, we're not going to accept it. There's no way they beat us. I'll go to my grave believing that. I personally myself don't want mine, and I would hope that none of my other teammates want theirs. Sixteen years ago, I put it in my will that my descendants could never, ever take a silver medal that was part of the 72 Olympic Games in Munich, Germany.